uh, introduce our, our next speaker, who, by sure coincidence, already met. Um, I want to it gives me great pleasure to introduce Linda Elder to you. She is the president and fellow of the Foundation for Critical Thinking. And among the things she brought, she's brought to critical thinking is this fierce emphasis on the impediments to thinking critically, on the things that stand in the way. Notice, that's not part of what does it mean, is it true, uh, what follows, and what alternatives are. The impediments to critical thinking, many of them, but specifically, ecocentrism and sociocentrism. Those are, they're just very powerful in her work, and they're, they're, those are immense barriers to critical thinking. They're barriers, egocentrism and sociocentrism are barriers not just to getting, not just to acquiring and developing the skills of critical thinking, but to the fair-mindedness that's involved in critical thinking and to the creation of a critical society. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce Linda Elder. I had no idea how to teach. 
absolutely no idea. Um, I, I also realized I really didn't even have a sense of what you would teach as a psychologist. Right? And I think in part because it is this huge mass of lots of different things that you could teach and lots of different events and systems of meaning. So um, at that same time, the first semester, I came to a conference just like this one, or very similar. And uh, I was introduced to critical thinking. And as, as Gerald, I had never heard of critical thinking before. And the first thing that I thought odd was that I had never heard of critical thinking before. Like, how could you be, at this point in your, in your um, let's say, schooling, have three degrees and have no sense of critical thinking? And it wasn't just I'd never heard the term critical thinking, but once I started learning what it is, I realized I didn't know any of the parts of it either. Okay, so I didn't, I had, I had very little command of my thinking. And it wasn't that I was just a, a poor thinker, because I think in some parts of my life I was okay thinker, and in other parts of my life I was not a good thinker at all. And so and I think that's true for most people. That is, we think well or better in some domains of life and others we don't think as well, and we don't really have a sense of the difference, and maybe we know that a little bit, but we don't really know how to get command the thinking that we're doing. Um, and so I started, you know, again, thinking about these new concepts, and of course it was overwhelming, and for those of you who are new, it will be overwhelming. If it's not, then we're probably not doing a very good job. Uh, and, because uh, there's so much to the, the theory. And uh, at first, I was a little resistant, having been to many, many workshops. I had, at that point, I'd been an administrator for 10 years, had been to many, many superficial conferences and events, and it took me a while to figure out that this was really worth the time of this was, in my words, the real gold. Because I had been exposed to fool's gold for a long time. And so I was resistant, and I think a lot of people are resistant, and they are resistant for good reason. So it took me a while to say, okay, let me just sit with this, not try to bring these other theories to the table and try to figure this out through those lenses, but just try to set aside what I already believe and just ask myself the question, do these ideas make sense? And if they do, then go with them. And the acid test is really, do, it, can I apply them in my life somewhere? And so the first thing that I did was said, oh, I'll take the elements of reasoning. So if every time you reason, you have a purpose, and you ask a question, and you use information, and there are implications of your reasoning, and you begin with assumptions, and you always think through concepts, and you begin with a point of view, if this is true, then what I'll do is I'll take a question, and I'll reason through the logic of it, using these eight elements. And the question that I asked was, how can I get my children to go to bed by 8 o'clock every morning <laughs> during the week? And I never, I never figured out the answer to that. But I did do the logic of it. And it was very helpful. It was like, wow, you can, you can really use this to direct your thinking. And you really, it really calls on you to ask yourself, what is my purpose? Is, is this a reasonable purpose? I mean, should I really be asking my children to do this? And what is the actual question I'm asking? And what's the information that's relevant? So this was the beginning, really, of my taking the ideas and, and bringing them into my own mind. Because I felt like, and I do feel, that the best way that I can help my students is first to help myself. That if I don't take the theory of critical thinking seriously, then how can I really ask them to do that? If I can't find faulty assumptions in my own thinking, then how can I help them find faulty assumptions in their thinking? And here I am now, I hate to say, almost 20 years later, and yes, I've improved as a thinker. And I say, if you do your 15 minutes every day, it is if you give 15 minutes of practice to critical thinking every day. You can't, you can't help but improve. You will improve as a thinker. But the, the, the forces are so powerful against us 
that all these years later, what I see is that there are still many, many, many deficiencies in my thinking. And I know the theory pretty well. Do I apply the theory as often as I should? No. Why is that? It's because of the, the powerful forces within us, namely egocentric and sociocentric thinking. And they're there. They're always going to be there. They're always going to be pulling us back from being the best that we can do. Be. But I believe that if we are going to ever create fair-minded critical societies, we have to take men of ourselves first. Mm -hmm.